Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly about uh, designing a autoclave steam steriliser uh, for safer surgical activities in some of our projects. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit uh, about the, the project itself and then give a bit of a lessons learned and uh, advantages of using the innovation process uh, that we did. So as an introduction, um, the innovation unit, we received a request from the biomedical and infection prevention control working groups basically saying that they needed a autoclave that could fit somewhere in between the existing systems. So uh, on the screen there is one of the systems that we currently use. It's quite basic, so it doesn't necessarily uh, do everything that we want. But then also the systems that are used in Europe or North America can be uh, too advanced. So basically the power requirements or water requirements are, are too extreme for the needs or, or the ability in the project. Um, Many reasons uh, were given for this, in increased water efficiency, uh, increased power, power um, efficiency as well. But one of the key things is that in uh, the Haiti project uh, we have with OCB um, and also uh, in Afghanistan, we're doing uh, increasingly complex surgery. So uh, particularly orthopedics, uh, and they often have uh, increasingly complex surgical instruments, which are hollow. So basically existing systems, the basic ones, can't actually uh, sterilize them to the adequate quality that we need. The way we did this is we started uh, very early on engaging all the key stakeholders around the movement internally and externally. Um, we really felt like this was uh, a necessity to make sure that whatever solution we came up with was going to be uh, the, was going to take in all the requirements and people weren't going to come back later on saying, oh, but it doesn't do this or it doesn't do this. Um, as part of this, we conducted qualitative research with uh, questionnaires to the medical departments, the biomed, the infection and prevention control. Uh, and then we moved on to looking at uh, quantitative uh, studies um, with academic institutions, looking at uh, the existing systems we've had and the reasons uh, why they maybe don't fulfill our needs perfectly or the reasons why they're breaking down regularly. We then engaged with a, a manufacturer, uh, Sterimed, who have now become MDS, who basically agreed to uh, produce a prototype for us, um, which uh, was based almost, uh, well, uh, entirely on the needs uh, briefing we gave them. Um, it was a pretty nice process. It was very uh, open. We said, could you produce a prototype? They said, yes. We sent them a, a sheet. And then uh, a few months later, they said, OK, we produced a prototype. And this is what it looked like. Um, so the next, the next point moved on to uh, the testing of it. So this was tested in Brussels um, in, I think it was February 2016. And in order to test it properly, uh, we made sure that we brought in lots of external experts on sterilization who could really uh, give us the kind of uh, the industry standard uh, to address the questions of if, if this was going to do the job properly. One of the things we noticed during this uh, was that the existing tests that we uh, would normally use to test a sterilization device uh, basically just weren't sufficient. So we'd normally use the Bowie-Dick test, which is looking at a uh, steam penetration of uh, effectively like a block of paper. Um, and that's fine for our more basic projects. But when it comes to dealing with uh, more complex hollow instruments, uh, Basic, the, the external experts uh, told us that that just wasn't going to do it. So what we needed was actually this uh, electronic testing system, which was lent to us by 3M. Um, and this allows for a full, a full test to include whether it's going to uh, sterilize complex instruments as well. Um, from, uh, from the test in Brussels, uh, initially uh, both the... Uh, existing systems we used, plus the new prototype, failed uh, this, this test. Um, but the good thing was, was, by having the external experts there, uh, they were fairly confident. They said, OK, this isn't a big issue. You just need to change the algorithm of the, of the sterilizer, uh, the prototype. Uh, and then they were confident that it would, uh, it would pass later. And sure enough, it did. Um, about two months later, after some adjustments uh, with the company, uh, we tested it with the uh, ETS, uh, and it passed. The, the old system didn't. Um, the next phase was to test this in the field. So in September, uh, the prototype was sent to Haiti. 
Um, and it was installed, uh, I think, over the course of about uh, half a day. Uh, it all went very smoothly, and then we had a week of training. <laughs> Uh, everything was going great. Uh, the, the manufacturers and the people in Stony had left, uh, and then a day later it broke. Um, <laughs> fortunately, having a good relationship with the manufacturer, they sent someone out a few weeks later uh, and uh, fixed it. It was a small issue with an electro valve, uh, really not a big deal, but that was something that we realized we hadn't really planned for maintenance so early on, which we should have done. In terms of results, we could say that this prototype uh, autoclave is 75% uh, more efficient in terms of water. Uh, it's 30% uh, 30, 30 uh, average time reduction in terms of the cycle time. Uh, and it's also verified for the tubular instruments, which was in the original brief. As a kind of uh, unexpected, well, maybe not unexpected, but uh, advantageous side note, uh, for staff, for the national staff working in the sterilization room, the autoclave, which is basically fully automated, you just press a button and it, and it, and it starts, uh, it has a reduced heat output, which means it's a more pleasant working environment for the staff, because um, in the sterilization room, it can get really hot because you've got these gas burners uh, with, the, with the old systems. Um, simplified and standardized, which means less error uh, and less uh, possibility of, of potentially damaging uh, instruments. Um, and, and also more time for staff to, to basically go and do other things uh, during it instead of having to monitor all the systems. Uh, also, we felt that the maintenance uh, requirements were quite reasonable compared to maybe European systems. In terms of next steps, uh, we're definitely looking at improving the prototype. Um, and we're also thinking about where else this can be used. If other organizations are interested in taking it on, maybe uh, MOH hospitals will be, because it fits quite nicely into, into that sort of category. Uh, it's also, for us, uh, we accept that if this uh, prototype you know, becomes, uh, is a lot of units are bought, and it becomes, uh, con like has continuity on the market, that's gonna be better for us, because it means that units potentially will get cheaper, and also the maintenance and spare parts will be easier to, to find. So the Swedish Innovation Unit, uh, we use an, a three-phase innovation process, which uh, follows the initiation, development, and implementation <laughs> stages. Uh, and we use this for the project. I'd say, uh, to date on this project, we've got to the, the seventh step on here, so the piloting. Uh, and now it's kind of a question of diffusing and hopefully buying more units uh, to see how it goes. For us, the advantages of this, uh, of this process, um, it's, it's a reflective process. It really allows uh, us internally as MSF to, to reevaluate the, the pros and the cons of our current systems. It also gives us a chance to gain new insights into the way that people are doing things. It's, it's something, for example, that often protocols would just go on for a very long time uh, and then only be reviewed, you know, maybe after like five or 10 years. Whereas here, just doing this process in itself is kind of a review as well as working towards a new prototype. It's much cheaper than producing an industry. Uh, and this is something that uh, some of the counter arguments for using innovation in MSF are that the market will just produce something eventually. But what you could say is that through the pro bono uh, work that universities have given us, through the relatively low rates that we work at in the innovation unit, plus like uh, the investment from external partners, and in this case, the manufacturer, the overall cost of producing this working prototype, which has worked very well, uh, has been much lower than it would be if an industry uh, uh, company or, or, or actor basically said, okay, we want to produce this, and they say, okay, well, it's going to cost us 100,000 instead of 40,000. Um, and then uh, an advantage of the innovation, unit, that's a bit of a plug, is that we, uh, we really like facilitating um, between internal and external partners, and we really feel like that's the best way to, to get a product which kind of fits all the needs and, and really bring in expertise. In terms of lessons learned, um, the timeline we had was potentially a little bit over, over optimistic. Um, that said, if you look at from, uh, I mean, I think from the point that the company was involved, that was about two years ago, um, 
and having a prototype which is so successful at this point. Uh, I think it was a very fast process, but as always with MSF, we like to say, okay, let's have it tomorrow. Uh, and that's maybe not possible, but bearing in mind a, a realistic timeline is definitely something uh, we need to, need to work with. Uh, we also saw that expertise uh, is really valuable uh, and it goes both ways. And I think this is something which we also sometimes don't appreciate when we're dealing with external partners is the idea that from a commercial point of view, if a company wants to get into a developing country sort of industry or, or work with other humanitarian organizations, the input that we put in as MSF is extremely valuable to them. So actually bearing that in mind and not just seeing it as a sort of one way, oh, thank you, you're helping us and saying, okay, actually you're getting some out, out of this as well and sort of uh, dealing on a, a level um, like balanced playing field. Uh, is is definitely a good thing. Uh, finally, I mean, the it was very clear from from this uh, project that we don't have that much expertise when it comes to the IP and licensee agreements, uh, and when it comes to commercial partnerships as well. We definitely have room for improvement to understanding exactly uh, what agreements should look like, uh, and I mean, in this case, it was a very positive uh, partnership, but. It, you know, it's making sure that we're prepared for for how these partnerships could go in in the sense of licensing or IP down the line is an important thing that we need to uh, we need to consider. To conclude, then uh, I think uh, the smiling faces there, uh, except for that guy up there, um, are uh, like to speak, speak for itself. Um, it was a very successful project. Basically, all the all the needs in the brief were met. Uh, I think we can say the the company were pleased with the product they they produced as well. They're looking to to expand the the market for this and sell more units, obviously. Um, and I think overall that was uh, a very positive experience. Um, finally, we got some acknowledgements. Uh, these are some of the partners we worked with, um, and that's it. Thank you. So any questions of clarity? One here and one here. Do you want to go here first? It's nearer to you. Can you hear me? No. Yes? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, how much did it cost? <laughs> in terms of development, um, the company put in around 40,000 euros uh, of, of their own money towards the development. Um, I think, obviously, the, the time costs of uh, the innovation units, I think, were maybe equivalent. So I, it's a tricky one, but I say under 100,000. And then the units themselves are aiming to be sold, I think, around the 25,000 uh, euro price point. And over here, if you could say your name and where you're from. Yeah, Thanks. I'm Hello? Hello? Um, that was just a question of Thanks. speaking into it. Okay, I'm Connor from MSF and I had a question about the commercial partnership. You had a successful com commercial partnership and I wanted to know if, uh, like, did you, did, you, did you frame that at the beginning with, uh, like, written MOUs or contracts? Was that very well framed or was that more ad hoc? Uh, I'd say in this case it was quite ad hoc. Um, I think uh, we were approaching it from the view of, okay, well, they're not promising anything, and we're not expecting anything, so let's just see how it goes. I think in the future, considering how successful it is, it would be better to, to frame it more formally, potentially. Okay, do you have it here? Yeah, I just, um, actually, one's a follow-on question, that yeah. price point, how does that compare to developing something in industry? Do you uh, know? It's a good question. I'm not... I can't say definitively, but the definitely speaking to people about it is the impression is that if you were to develop it in an industry, it would be significantly, maybe four or five times higher. Right. Okay. And secondly, um, is that is it is it now still in place in Tabar in, in Haiti? Is it actually yeah, yeah, there yeah. working? Yeah, it's, it's still working. It's still oh, working. Oh, cool. Uh, and hasn't had any problems since. <laughs> I'm liking that. <laughs> and uh, lastly, actually, is, a, is about really back to that partnership. Was how did you select that company or, and why? Um, it was a bit of serendipity, really. Uh, they actually had come, I think they'd approached uh, OCA, uh, basically saying, we want to get involved with uh, some of your autoclave products, and the contact got passed on, so it was just coincidence. Yeah. Lovely. We have a couple of questions on this side. 
Hello, uh, Katini from uh, MSF also. Um, how did the cost of licensing uh, relate to the cost of development? Is the microphone working? Sorry, if we can hear you. Just for our online audience as well. Oh, sorry. The, the cost of licensing, uh, how did they compare to the cost of developing? Could you maybe elaborate uh, on that? So I, in, in what sense? Well, I can imagine uh, you have the cost of developing. Mm -hmm. That's one uh, one expenditure. But then uh, the cost of uh, the licensing procedure, that would also entail cost and to maintain the license, et cetera, et cetera. That would also involve uh, costs. Uh, I can imagine that at some point the uh, producer would take over those costs. But uh, this is always an issue. If you develop a new product, at some point there is insufficient market or demand, and then there is no interest to continue uh, spending on the maintaining the li licensing and that, that causes in problems. So yeah, how, so, how, uh, how does, how so actually at the moment there, there is no formalized licensee agreement. Effectively the, the manufacturer has taken on all that cost and it's, it's their product. Um, so that could be seen as something we need to work on. Um, but also from our perspective it's like, well, we have the product that we wanted. Question here, a couple of rows behind. Okay, uh, um, I did not understand if the device uh, for testing the sterilization process was part of the innovation process or, I mean, you the, the invent device, the device? The, the, the 3M, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. so, uh, so that is an existing device um, from 3M. The fact was that as, uh, well, the, exp the internal experts we were using uh, and external, it was just through the conversation with the external experts that it became apparent that our existing uh, testing system was not up to uh, standard when it came to the complex instruments. So it already existed, and they uh, 3M actually loaned it through us through a contact. Great question there. Hi, um, I'm Joanna Keenan from MSF's in international office. Just on the uh, licensing and IP, um, so is it the company that holds the, particularly the IP side of things, and, and kind of how, how is that, or does the innovation unit share some of the IP, and how do you kind of envisage the intellectual property on this in the future? Is it something you kind of hope to, you know, kind of like what Terry was saying in the beginning to, to kind of make a, a bit more of a multiplex kind of platform, open source kind of thing to, to kind of share it and be a little bit more affordable in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. Uh, so for for this project, um, basically the, there is very little agreement. It's, it's very kind of based on a good relationship that we have with the manufacturer. Um, I think for, we're seeing this in some of the other projects we're running, that to get a more formalized IP uh, agreement early on is key. Uh, again, I think for this project, just that this device is now kind of on the market and available to us, we've kind of seen as, as uh, an advantage in itself, though there would be room to, to potentially for future projects go into that.